And so next we'll talk a little bit about chromatin accessibility and how that relates to epigenetic regulation. So chromatin accessibility could be formally defined as the percent of time that a given piece of the genome is being occupied by a nucleosome. And so it's just like with histone modifications, it's not necessarily a heritable event, uh, but just like histone modifications, chromatin accessibility really plays a critical role in gene regulation in the sense that the accessibility of a genome can, of a segment of the genome can change as a result of how that cell responds to an environment. And so it's important to note that chromatin accessibility, like my definition here uh, suggests, is not really a on or off thing. It's not so much that chromatin is either closed or it's open at any given time. Uh, there's a whole range of, of accessibility that a particular segment of the genome can undergo. And so on one end of the spectrum, obviously chromatin can be in a completely closed state. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, obviously chromatin can be completely open and free of nucleosomes. Um, and ready for, for example, uh, pull 2 binding or TF binding. But there is like a range in between open and closed chromatin. And so in this kind of permissive chromatin state, uh, chromatin can be open just enough such that if there are key like subsets of transcription factors, typically called pioneer factors or pioneer TFs, uh, those pioneer TFs may be able to bind to regions that are partially occupied by uh, nucleosomes and therefore recruit what are called chromatin remodelers to come in and then either displace, uh, displace nucleosomes or enhance their binding at that particular region. And so there's a number of chromatin accessibility assays uh, that are currently used in the scientific literature. And so here we'll just kind of go over three major ones that you'll oftentimes see. And so the first one uh, is called ATAC-seq. And so ATAC-seq stands for uh, assay for transposable accessible chromatin using sequencing. And so the key idea of ATAC-seq is that essentially it uses what's called a uh, hyperactive transposase, uh, which is the domain represented by TN5. And so this hyperactive transposase uh, is essentially preloaded uh, with Illumina sequencing adapters. And so just like other transposases, uh, TN5 basically goes in and it randomly cleaves and uh, cleaves parts of uh, essentially open or accessible chromatin. And whenever it cleaves uh, the genome at these accessible positions, it inserts sequencing adapters into these, into these kind of freshly cleaved uh, regions. And so essentially the sequencing adapters act kind of like as a probe for measuring where uh, chromatin was accessible because uh, TN5 is biased towards cutting uh, and open chromatin. Uh, and so essentially you'll find that ATAC-seq is generally the most widely adopted uh, chromatin accessibility assay uh, out there right now because essentially compared to, for example, DNA-seq, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, it's more robust, it's more reproducible. Uh, the protocol is generally pretty easy. And most importantly, uh, the amount of input number of cells you need in order to get good ATAC-seq data is relatively small. And so for bulk ATAC-seq, uh, you can basically perform this assay uh, with as few as 500 cells. And the total experiment actually takes somewhere on the order of two hours. Uh, and there's actually like a commercial, you can actually buy like a commercial product uh, to do, for example, even single cell attack seek. So you can even do attack seek at single cell level. Uh, in contrast, for example, like DNA seek, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, you typically need like hundreds of thousands of cells as input. Uh, the protocol takes multiple days. Uh, and in practice, there's very, there's relatively few uh, research labs around the world that can do uh, DNA, one, DNA seek uh, reliably. And so attack seek is just much more accessible. <laughs> And so DNA-seq, uh, which stands for DNA's one hypersensitive site sequencing, uh, uses an endonuclease called DNA's one uh, which basically cleaves DNA uh, also within accessible chromatin uh, near pyrimidines. And so here, uh, for example, the red X's show you that uh, DNA-seq can't really uh, cut DNA that's being occupied by proteins. Uh, not only 
um, not only histones, but also, for example, transcription factors. And that's also true for TagSeq, actually. And so there's a few variations of DNA-seq depending on um, how those kind of initially large fragments that get cut by DNA-seq, or sorry, uh, DNAs one uh, end up getting f cut further. So basically, uh, to do short read sequencing, for example, you need typically short fragments. And so you might do an initial pass with DNA uh, one. And then you might, for example, do another pass with DNA one to cut the fragments even shorter. Or you might just use restriction enzymes. Um, and basically, once you get short fragments, then you can just ligate some sequencing adapters and, and then sequence. Um, and so DNA-seq, as I was mentioning on the previous slide, was one of the first major chromatin accessibility assays to be used. And it's uh, there's a lot of data out there, uh, in particular generated by the ENCODE uh, consortium using DNA's uh, one hypersensitivity. But it's kind of um, recently fallen out of favor uh, for, for example, ATAC-seq, uh, mainly because, again, it's it's highly challenging to work with in practice. And ATAC-seq is, is just a much easier protocol. And finally, I want to quickly talk about uh, MNA-seq, which stands for microcalcal nuclease sequencing. Um, and so MNA-seq uses, uh, uses in uh, kind of a combined endo and exonuclease called MNAs that basically uh, is able to cleave uh, and eliminate accessible DNA, essentially. And so the major distinction between MNA-seq and ATAC-seq and DNA-seq uh, is that with MNA-seq, you're essentially sequencing nucleosome-bound DNA, uh, not nucleosome-free DNA. And so generally what happens is uh, when you initially uh, when you initially expose uh, chromatin to MNAs, what will happen is that MNAs will initially cut uh, only the open regions, uh, leaving you with uh, nucleosomes with kind of long genomic tails to them. And then because uh, the MNAs enzyme or nuclease is also an exonuclease, It'll essentially eventually cut away at the uh, at the tails of the at the free tails of the nucleosome bound genomic DNA, such that you're really only left with uh, genomic DNA that's uh, co bound to nucleosomes, and so that's what ends up getting sequenced. And so something worth pointing out that when you perform, for example, uh, like a TAC-seq or even DNA one hypersensitive uh, sequencing. When you perform either of these assays to high enough depth, what's going to actually happen is that, again, both the TAC-seq and DNA-seq um, cut at open chromatin or accessible chromatin. And so generally speaking, the reads uh, will align to the genome where um, regions of the genome were accessible. But if you sequence at a high enough depth and have a high enough library complexity, and we'll talk about library complexity, what that really means uh, later on in this lecture. Then what you'll actually notice is that if there are regions of the open chromatin where transcription factors are strongly bound, then again, because TFs, uh, because any kind of protein binding uh, on DNA prevents, uh, for example, TN5, uh, TN5 transposase from working there or from, or it also prevents DNAs1 uh, from making cuts where the TF is bound to the uh, DNA, what you'll actually notice is that uh, there will be like a region where there's a lot of reads from, for example, TAC-seq uh, mapping to that region, but you'll notice a big depletion around the region where the TF is bound uh, to the DNA. And so the analysis of the identification of those kind of very small, uh, strong depleted regions uh, is what's known as uh, TN5 footprinting. Um, and so the idea here is that the signature about how the, or essentially the shape of the reads that map to that particular region, uh, essentially kind of reflect the size and the binding mechanism, the transcription factor. Um, and so people are, people are able to kind of do analyses of the shapes of these, um, of the read distribution around these TF binding sites in order to learn something about the kind of about the biophysical properties of transcription factors and how they bind to DNA, essentially. And so this slide basically just um, summarizes essentially the practical differences you would see in the data uh, that you get between, for example, uh, DNA's one hypersensitivity, uh, TAC-seq, and MNA-seq. And so 
Again, DNA-seq and attack-seq both profile open chromatin. And so uh, here in this cartoon diagram, you can see that both attack-seq and DNA-seq uh, would kind of capture the major open chromatin region uh, in this diagram. Whereas attack-seq, because it's it's a more sensitive assay, essentially it would uh, it would also capture reads that and map them to uh, the regions in between uh, nucleosome bound DNA, for example. And so that's so you can really see attack seq would get higher resolution than DNA seq in those in those regions that are kind of um, less accessible in some case, or in some sense. Uh, on the other hand, again, because MNA seq uh, degrades uh, open chromatin and it only sequences nucleosome bound uh, DNA, you can see that MNA seq reads basically map to regions that are close uh, to the nucleosome bound DNA, and so. You might ask yourself, well, why do the MNA seq reads seem to map to the same locations as the uh, as some of the attack seq peaks? If MNA seq um, basically generates reads uh, that should map to nucleosome bound DNA versus attack seq, which should map reads to open regions, and so the reason is that uh, when you do MNA sequencing, if you look back on the on the appropriate slide, uh, what you'll notice is that MNA seq leaves you with genomic fragments that are entirely bound by uh, nucleosomes. And so when you do, for example, paradin sequencing, you'll end up sequencing the ends of uh, nucleosome bound DNA, and those ends will tend to correspond to the regions between nucleosomes. And so that's why on this diagram, the MNAs peaks look like they overlap the ataxy peaks. And so there's a number of ways in which chromatin accessibility can be remodeled dynamically. And so the first general, general approach is uh, through what you could call passive competition of transcription factors. And so the idea here is that uh, a lot of nucleosomes kind of have a natural amount of turnover and the chromatin remodelers uh, might come in and kind of move nucleosomes around here or there. And so during this process where nucleosomes are kind of moving in and out, of a particular region, a transcription factor uh, may just happen to get lucky in some sense and bind to a particular region that happens to be free of a nucleosome at a given time, and therefore start the process of, for example, transcription and keep it open in that sense. Another approach that chromatin gets remodeled is through uh, what you could call passive competition of transcription factors with architectural proteins. And so, for example, there are certain subsets of proteins that are not nucleosomes that tend to get uh, associated with chromatin in a transient way. And these architectural proteins um, typically aren't fixed on the chromatin. And so when these uh, APs essentially uh, get released from the chromatin, then that gives other transcription factors an opportunity to come in and potentially with the help of uh, chromatin remodelers, can essentially recruit other what are called like secondary factors or what's labeled as SF in this figure to then come in, bind to the region, and then initiate transcription. A third approach is, is basically by, uh, through transcription factors uh, binding to and recognizing enhancers that are constitutionally open. And so for example, uh, certain enhancers, certain like strong enhancers, for example, might have a relatively uh, strong transcription factor, uh, which is labeled here as TF prime, uh, bound to that enhancer, which may be essentially keeping that enhancer in an open, uh, open chromatin state. And so some additional transcription factor may be able to come in, bind to this enhancer, therefore go and recruit additional chromatin remodeling factors and further open up the region uh, for transcription, for example. And finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a set of transcription factors called pioneer transcription factors that are able to bind to regions that have nucleosomes in them and basically recruit, actively recruit chromatin remodelers in order to open up, uh, open up those regions of the chromatin for secondary factors and um, other non-pioneer transcription factors to come in and basically just bind and start transcription. So it's worth pointing out that chromatin accessibility is a highly dynamic property of cells. Uh, 
And so to give an example, uh, here on the left, I'm showing you the reads corresponding to a bulk attack seek uh, assay done on PBMCs. Uh, this locus is basically a represents a set of genes that are housekeeping genes. So these genes should be in some sense constitutively transcribed. And so here you can see uh, the bulk attack seek assay uh, shows you that reads uh, are generally speaking piling up uh, at the transcription start site of a number of genes in this locus. But if you look at the individual single cell attack seek uh, assays represented by the middle uh, row of this diagram, and so each row here represents a single cell, and each column represents the same locus as uh, the bullock attack seek. And so here you can see that even for these constitutively expressed genes, there's a lot of population level uh, variation in terms of the accessibility of any given position in this locus. And so you can see that because the not all the rows are the same, there's a lot of variation in the uh, accessibility between rows. And so this is just, you know, this just goes to show you that even for so-called constitutively expressed genes, there's a lot of variation in terms of the nucleosome occupancy uh, at these positions. So here on the right, uh, I'm just showing you a uh, schematic. It kind of summarizes what we talked about on the left part of the slide. And so basically the top part of this figure on the right shows you a hypothetical bulk attack seek assay for a surrounding a transcription start site of a transcriptionally active gene. And so you can see as you'd expect that there's a lot of accessibility near the transcription start site, um, as well as downstream of the transcription start site, uh, and uh, overall less accessibility upstream of the transcription start site. Um, and you can also, so you can also see uh, different rows corresponding to hypothetical single cell attack seek experiments, where each individual row represents a different uh, hypothetical cell in the population. And so you can see by comparing the different rows of the single cell attack seek experiment, uh, you can see that the region upstream of the transcription start site, generally speaking, typically has moderately well positioned nucleosomes. And so what that means is that the nucleosomes aren't completely fixed in location, so they still move around um, and they're relatively sparse. And so that's kind of what you'd expect. So there, there will be open regions corresponding to where, for example, enhancers or different promoter elements are, uh, but there still can be nucleosomes uh, occupying positions that, for example, don't have important regulatory elements that were uh, you know, partially responsible for driving transcription. Uh, and this is in contrast to the uh, gene body, which is downstream of the transcription start site, where you can see that nucleosomes uh, are typically what people call weakly positioned. And so what that means is that uh, they're easily displaced. And that's kind of what you would expect, because if your gene is being actively transcribed, then that means that RNA pull 2 is running through the gene body of this gene. And so nucleosomes have to be pushed out of the way in order for uh, RNA pull 2 to, to transcribe your gene.